Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Logan for Liberty channel. My name is Logan, as you can tell, because this channel is named after me. Today I want to talk to you about a book that I read that was really good called Gathering Blue. Um, if you clicked on this video, you probably know what Gathering Blue is, or you were thinking about buying the book of Gathering Blue, but other than that, you know what it is. But for those of you who don't know what Gathering Blue is, either because you thought this was an interesting title, you clicked on it, or you're a fan of my channel and a fan of my videos so you wanted to hear what I had to say about something or you clicked on this video out of pure boredom for some reason I'm not sure why let me explain to you what gathering blue is gathering blue is the second book in the giver quartet um, it's called the giver quartet it's a set of four books obviously it's called the giver quartet because the first book in the series is called the giver which was written in the 90s I believe 1993 don't quote me on that I could be wrong nonetheless the giver is the first book in the series and eventually Lewis Lois or Lewis Laurie eventually got around I believe it's Lois eventually got around to writing gathering blue and then she wrote after gathering blue messenger and then Sun but I just read gathering blue I read it less than a week I mean, I started it a while back, but I've been really trying to get into reading. So I decided, okay, let me get through Gathering Blue. And I was only on like page 25 or page 24. I was barely past chapter 3, basically. So I read the book, and I told myself, right, I'm going to start reading, obviously, for the benefits. And let's just say I could not put this book down. I forced myself to read and I fell in love with this book and I'll probably I'm definitely gonna read more I have the book messenger on its way this book is a sequel to the giver kind of it's not a direct sequel it, it takes place in the same universe and it takes place after the events of the giver but it doesn't necessarily play off the events of the giver not yet anyway there is a reference towards the end. That's not a spoiler. There is a reference towards the end that kind of hints at the possibility of tying in with the giver. You only know that if you've read Messenger. I've had that part kind of spoiled for me, but it's not really a spoiler because it doesn't affect the overall story of Gathering Blue or even Messenger for that matter. Nonetheless, and you wouldn't even know that that's relevant at all. It's just dropped in in a line and that's it. If you haven't read The Giver, go read The Giver. If you're not much of a reader, go see the movie of The Giver. Now, you've probably heard this a million times, but the book is better than the movie, as it usually is. Even if you have read The Giver, go see the movie. It's a great movie. I will say, before I continue on, there is one thing I don't like about the movie. Um, I like the movie overall. I, I think it's an enjoyable movie. and But there's a scene towards the end where they show a compilation of sort of humanity in a way um of the human experience i would say it's a compilation of different cultures of people dancing laughing and singing which is supposed to showcase you the human experience shows a baby a couple shows more primitive societies and it shows skyscrapers and sunsets and storm and rain i summed it up as a human experience it was a perfect plot device for the movie, but it felt weird. It felt like it It didn't fit the pacing. It felt out of place. It didn't fit the tone of the movie. They didn't execute it in a way that I felt was effective, even though it was crucial for the storyline in movie form. Because uh, there's something about movies... There's something about books that don't translate perfectly into movies, so that was their way of translating that sort of scene. Nonetheless, without further ado, let's get started on Gathering Blue. Right off the bat, Gathering Blue hooks you right in, just like that. You start with the main character out in the field of leaving, as they call it. She is uh, sitting by her mother's body, and sort of, metaphorically, although they describe it kind of literally, Kira f feels like she can see her mother's spirit leave her body. Not in a supernatural way, more of a faith-based way. 
Kira, th this book isn't necessarily a religious book, so don't get that idea. It's just used as a device to tell the story. Kind of. Um, it doesn't say that the spirit rises up. She, she basically talks about how she could... It's almost as if she could feel a spirit leave her mother's body. Her mother is dead. She died from an illness. And in the distance, it describes Kira looking at the smoke of her cot being burned. Because that's what they do in this village. The village is very primitive. It, it's the opposite of the giver. Because in the giver, it was a very technologically advanced community. In this story, it takes place in a village that's sort of primitive in a way. Or old-fashioned. Um, if you've ever seen the movie The Village, this sort of has a similar vibe. Completely, there, I feel like when M. Night Shyamalan made the movie The Village, he took some inspiration from this book. I don't know if that's true, but that's what it feels like. And I'm maybe I'm just drawing parallels. They're not the same story, but there's some similarities. And this is way better than the movie The Village, by the way. There's no weird plot twist. The, um, I'll just say that right now. She's not going to walk outside the village and see a, a police cruiser driving by. So let's just get that out of the way. Anyway, Kira is in this field. Looking in the distance in the horizon, she sees smoke coming from what was her cot being burned. Which is what they do when an illness comes. They will burn whatever was touched by the person who, who was ill to the ground. Um... And in the field, there's a bunch of, I don't know, it doesn't say how many people, but there's dead bodies. It's called the field of the leaving, where the spirits leave the bodies. And the bodies, after they're dead, they, they're they basically to be taken away by creatures, by the beasts. And then eaten and taken away and then left to rot. Kira sees a woman with a young infant. Uh, I don't remember if they named her. She also sees her mother's brother, a.k.a. her uncle, with his own wife. Um, I don't know if she died from an illness. It doesn't really... I don't know if it explains it. It kind of plays on later. I guess they do explain it. Anyway. But they don't really acknowledge each other. So she sees her uncle with her aunt by marriage. And uh, they're two tykes. They, they refer to children as tykes. Here's the thing with Kira though. After her mother is dead, she has nobody. Her father's out of the picture. Her father, as they explained, was taken by the beasts on a hunting trip. Which is a very important part of the story. Um, but Kira is, essentially, she's screwed. And let me explain why. She has a bent leg. A crooked leg. She has a club foot, basically. So one leg is almost useless. And if she stands on it too long, it pains her. So she has to walk with a cane. Nonetheless, after several days, because she's been with her mother's body for several days, she walks back to where her cot's going to be, and she's going to rebuild it. She doesn't know how she's going to do it, but she's going to do it because she wants to live. Because in the village, what they do to people who aren't useful or who have deformities, they take them to the field to be taken by the beasts. They basically leave them there to die. And they describe a scene when... Because Kira is remembering her mother Katrina and one of the stories that her mother told her about when she was a kid, when she was a baby and men came to the cot and they were going to take her away because of her bent leg because she was going to use more resources than she could be productive. She was going to consume more than she could produce. She was useless. She was flawed. So they were going to take her as a small child or as a baby, but her mother defended her and her mother was kind of important and her father before his death was an important man too. So they decided to let her stay. They made an exception. Anyway, Kira's walking back to her cot and uh, she meets a young boy named Matt. Matt, well, she doesn't meet him, but she runs into him. Matt is a friend of hers. Matt comes from a place called The Fen, which is a place within a village. It's basically the slum in the village, which is kind of sad because the entire village is basically a slum, so it's a slum within a slum. And this boy's dirty, and he has a dog with him named Branch that he calls Branchy. And Kira kind of sees herself in the dog, sort of. Not literally, but I guess 
Yeah, uh, obviously not literally. Um, not as in she can, she, she feels like a dog or anything. The dog has a bent tail and the dog's kind of useless in a way. What happened was Matt found the dog branch. Um, well, he found the dog and the dog was hurt. The dog was injured and left for dead and out in a storm. So Matt found the dog and he moved it underneath a shrub underneath bushes to kind of protect it from the elements. Therefore, the dog was able to heal. And when the dog and Matt brought it food and brought it help, brought it medicine or bandages or whatever, and health nursed the dog back to health. And he named the dog Branch because it was underneath a giant bush. And ever since, Matt and the dog have... A, Matt's a, t a tyke. He's a little kid. Matt and the dog have been companions. The dog Branch follows Matt wherever he goes. She runs into Matt. Matt tells him about a girl named Vendera who has a vendetta for Kira. Vendera is a woman with a scar on her face. And she's kind of a mean woman. Uh, she picks on Kira a little bit. When she, she comes to where Kira's at, where her cod's at, and she's trying to take Kira's property. She wants Kira's land because it would be more beneficial to have Kira's land as opposed to her own. And she doesn't like Kira because she's really traditional with the rules. People who are flawed, people who aren't perfect, go to the field and they leave. And she despises Kira. Maybe out of jealousy. Who knows? She doesn't like Kira at all, um, and she's going to take her property to hold her own tykes, to farm her own land, and basically take space away from somebody she deems useless. Vendera, of course, uh, eventually leaves her alone. She has her whole posse from her part of the village. Eventually, while uh, Vendera leaves her alone, Kira's doing her own thing, and a messenger comes, and... The messenger has an insect bite. I just remember that part for some reason. I don't know why. But she she comes to Kira in the dawn. And, um, so at night, I guess. And he tells Kira that she must report to the Council of Guardians, which is sort of the centralized authority of the village. Um, I don't know if they're elected or if the Council of Guardians choose who the next guardian or council member will be. They don't go into detail about that. Um, I assume they're selected. I'm inferring because of other plot points in the story. And so... The next day, Kira goes to... The edifice, which is this giant building. It's the best build one of the best buildings in the village, probably the biggest. It isn't as slummy as the rest of the village. It has plumbing. She goes to, and basically the edifice is a cross between a courthouse and sort of a capital building like the American White House. You live there and uh, trials are done there, rituals are done there. So this building, it's, it's sort of their sanctuary. It's, it's a church, it's the White House, it's the courthouse, and it's a residential center for important people. So, Kira goes there, she goes to the room, I believe, the council room? She, she basically goes into this giant room, this hall. And she sits down, and Vendera is there, the council of guardians is there, the entire council, which they're basically just like judges or politicians in a way. They're the centralized authorities of the village. Vendera went to the Council of Guardians. She is trying to take her property and she's trying to get Kira brought to the field of the leaving because she wants Kira dead. She wants her property. So basically, she she accuses Kira of breaking the rules because Kira doesn't have anybody to protect her. Kira is not fit for the village according to the laws. And uh, the Council, Jameson, who says, I can defend you if you want because I'm more educated about this matter. matter. And Kira's like, all right, go ahead, defend me. And this, this man's name is Jameson, and he goes, he's basically saying, yeah, Vendera's accusations are right. You have a bent leg. You're useless. You eat more than you can, or you consume, you consume more than you produce. Therefore, yeah, we would bring you to the field of leaving. But they, but he keeps mentioning that we can make exceptions. 
and it's not really a spoiler because it happens within the first 50 pages, they make an exception for Kira. They let her stay despite her flaws, despite the fact that she's kind of useless because she's not necessarily useless. In the end, though, Vandera does get the property. Vandera kind of gets what she wants. I think it's Vandera or Vandana. I don't remember. The Scarface girl. We'll call it Scarface girl. Um. The, anyway, so they give her the property. They let her have Kira's land. But they let Kira live. And they give Kira quartering in the edifice, which is the main building. Because uh, Kira can sew. She's a sewer or a threader. She's good with fabrics and cloth. She can sew. She can weave. She can do all of that. And Kira kind of lied a little bit because she wants to save her life. She basically led on to the idea. She, she led the council to believe the Council of Guardians, she led them to believe that she can do more than she actually can. So, they spared her, and that's actually an important part later in the book. There's, yeah, um, I won't spoil that for you. So, they let her live, um, and they bring her to her housing, and she's next to the carver. And her job is to fix the robe, and she knows what the robe is. It's the robe of the singer. Once a year, this village has a gathering where a singer will get up on stage and sing a song of the ruin of the past, and will tell the story of times before them. It'll, it'll talk about the flood, about illnesses, about fire in the sky, and all these cities that have been destroyed and crumbled into rubble. And that's the job of the singer. He sings about that. And he holds a staff, and he has a robe. And her mother, Kira's mother, Katrina, worked on this robe and basically stitched in designs of the story. And when the singer is singing, he'll pose in a certain way to expose a certain section on the robe that fits the story. It's sort of a visualization, a representation, because I'm assuming they don't have PowerPoint or television. <laughs> so that's their way of providing a visual aid. And the carver's job, carver, Thomas, Thomas the carver, his job is to carve the staff. And what the staff is, the singer holds the staff, and the staff sort of helps him get through the song. It's almost like holding a piece of paper, sheet music. That's what the staff is. The staff has designs and carvings, so the singer can see at what point of the story he's at or what order to go into. It's his notes, basically. So we have the carver, the singer, and I don't remember the title for Kira, but the threader or the sewer, the weaver, the fabricer, fabric worker, I'm not sure. So we have a person who can carve wood, a person who can sing very well, and a person who can deal with fabrics very well. And I talked about how Kira lied. She did lie. She's not as good as she told the council. She's good. She's very good. And the council knew that. So Kira was assigned to f basically repair the robe that her mother had been repairing. Uh, and obviously add new designs to tell stories. And the singer would remember the song that he had to remember. The carver would carve the staff, re-carve it, redesign it, add new stuff, whatever the council told them to add. So eventually we get to the point where Jameson, the council member who stuck up and saved Kira, is talking to her and she admits that she doesn't know everything about her her sewing ability. She doesn't know everything about threading and yarning because her mother died before she could teach her everything. And that's when we learn that Kira can't dye yarn. She doesn't know anything about dye. So Jameson tells her, okay, well, if you don't know anything about dye, then go to a woman named Annabella. Um, she lives in this part of the forest. Don't worry, you can go through, just follow the path, follow the trail, and no beasts will take you. So, Kira walks to the path, and she has Matt and Branch with her the first time, the tyke and the little dog. And she meets Annabella, who's basically a hermit, or a retired old lady living in a house, and she has herbs and plants growing that she makes with her dyes. She's going over, Annabella is going over... She's with Kira going over what plants make what dyes. There's several plants for certain colors, and there's one color which plays into the story at some point, which I won't spoil for you, blue. 
uh, the plant for Blue isn't in the village. So she can't make a blue yarn. Anyway, Kira asks Annabella where the blue is, and uh, Annabella kind of points, saying over there, but you can't really go over there through the forests and whatnot. So here's a problem that we run into the story. Kira can't remember all of them, but she also can't read because women in this village are forbidden to learn how to read and write. So boys can read and write. Only some can read and write. But because she befriends the carver Thomas that she eats breakfast, lunch, and dinner with, Thomas says, hey, um, I know how to write so I can carve into wood. Um, the Basically a list of things for you to remember. But Kira goes, well, I can't read or write so how's that gonna help me and Thomas is saying well I can read it to you so he carves down what Kira can remember and then basically every day Kira would go to Annabella to learn a new die she'd remember new stuff write it down Thomas would carve it for her and in that way Kira watching Thomas carve she kind of or write down with a pen she kind of learned how to I don't know I think he wrote with a pen on some wood or a piece of paper. Nonetheless, she watches Thomas write, and she kind of learns a, a few letters because there's some repeating letters. She learns through pattern recognition um, how to read some of what he's put down. Nonetheless, she's learning how to die, and eventually she's walking down the path, and she runs into some beasts. She doesn't run into beasts. She hears beasts. And Matt and Branch aren't with her. Matt and Branch got bored of going to Annabella's house and the path has been relatively safe and Kira's been able to do it despite her crooked leg and the fact that she walks on a cane so Matt and Branch didn't go and she hears a growling and she tells Annabella hey there's beasts on the path and people said there weren't no beasts in this area and Annabella responds by saying there are no beasts and Kira's like wait what I heard beasts how can you say there's there's no beasts um, that's the rest of that, the conclusion of that spoiler. Is there beasts or is there not beasts? Because remember, her father was killed by beasts on a hunting trip. And she heard the growling. So is Annabella a crazy lady? Anyway, that's not important. Gathering Blue, the story builds. I, I kind of told you all that stuff to not really end it. Nonetheless, she befriends Thomas. She befriends Matt. And eventually downstairs... They meet a little girl who is to be the next singer, and she's about Matt's age. I think she's actually younger than Matt. Oh, and in the story, the they don't have years for their ages. Instead, they have syllables with the name. So Kira and Thomas, they both have two syllable names. So they're around the same age. Katrina had three syllables. She's older than Kira. Matt has one syllable, Jamison obviously has not many syllables Annabella has four syllables so she's an elder so their age goes by syllables so after you reach a certain growth or age you get an extra syllable to your name that's how they recognize ages not necessarily by years nobody in the book or the story was referred to as blank years old unlike the giver they actually had ages and then at an age they were assigned a job I want to stress with Gathering Blue, do not think that Gathering Blue is going to be like The Giver. It's similar, there's some similar tones, but it's not the same. Um, the ending is also very different. Gathering Blue has a great ending. Um, every single character introduced in this book has a purpose. Annabella serves a purpose. Um, Matt serves a purpose. Even Branch serves a purpose. She... Kira sees herself in Branch, kind of, because Branch is this useless dog that nobody would want. Yet there's this boy named Matt who fell in love with the dog and saved the dog despite the dog being kind of useless. And now Matt has a permanent companion, which is the dog. Um, Thomas, he's been alone for a while. He's just carved on the staff. Um, he kind of, he gets headaches from doing his job, even though he said he loved carving. It was an art to him, but he gets headaches working on this staff. Kira, she has this cloth because she used to like to sew and weave when she was a little girl before she was assigned this job. And she doesn't really understand what Thomas means by 
getting headaches from carving, but then eventually she becomes sympathetic to what he's talking about because she understands. Matt, believe it or not, Matt and Branch, like I said, they serve a really important part of the story. Matt serves an extremely important part of the story. And Lois Laurie is amazing at this for some reason. She's just... Everything that she writes into the book ties in one way or another. It's The Gathering Blue is almost like Kira's ability to to weave and and so it all it there's these threads that don't really mean anything at first glance but when you finish the book it all comes together and connects of course i believe messenger takes place right after gathering the blue so messenger t is this book it has a kind of a slow but steady build um, I didn't find myself bored. I found myself waiting in anticipation for, for what's going to happen next. And I couldn't put the book down. And then when I got to the end of it, I'm like, oh gosh, I have to go get the second or the third one. I have to go buy a messenger. I guess the second one as far as Gathering Blue goes. I'm trying to think what else because I kind of went on that tangent about what happens about Kira going to Annabella, which really led to nothing. In the book, it leads to something, but I can't talk about it too much to spoil it. Um, eventually, there's a problem, and Kira has to learn herself about how to die things. Uh, maybe it's related to the beasts. Who knows? I can't really talk about much past that. Without spoiling it too much. Um, Thomas and Kira become close friends. They eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. And he sort of befriends Matt and Branch as a result of Matt and Branch being there for Kira. Kira finds some friends. Um, she hasn't really thought about her mother that much. Which plays an important part in the story. Let me. I want to go into spoilers so bad. I'm not doing this book justice. Um, Kira goes through... She is a perfect example of the hero's journey in this book, in a way. Um, th like I said, this specific story in The Giver Quartet is a two-parter. I haven't read Messenger yet, but I know it takes place right after this book. So it's almost like, if I could make an analogy between movies, uh, Luke Skywalker. Star Wars A New Hope, skilled, but kind of useless. I guess not useless, he blew up the Death Star. But uh, his character in A New Hope is vastly different from his character in Empire Strikes Back and his character in The Return of the Jedi. For any of you Star Wars fans out there, vastly different. And Kira, while she, she goes through a drastic change, she goes from being alone and fearful to hopeful and almost fulfilled in a way because she finds out what her job is going to be, what her calling is going to be. Because she kind of falls out of love with sewing, even though she loves it, which is directly related with Thomas, the carver, who gets headaches from doing his job, even though he loves carving. And uh, sort of, there's a point where they're watching the singer, the, the elder singer, the main one, not the little girl who's probably going to replace him someday. There's something that Kira notices as she sees and she hears it. And there's something that, you know, it'll explain it in the book. And you're just like, oh shit. Sorry for cussing. You're like, oh crap. That's, that's, wow. And it ties into the story. It doesn't have a dramatic ending as much as The Giver did. Because The Giver, that story arc was done. It had an ambiguous ending. And it didn't have to be continued. But it was continued because... Why not? Because we got some great books. Gathering Blue, on the other hand, not, it has a satisfying ending, but it needed a second book, which is what it got. Like I said, the Gathering Blue, it, to me, it's a perfect book, almost. So, it's so amazing. There's so much playing. It takes what the Giver did well and added more and expanded upon it. In my opinion, The Giver was too short. I wish The Giver was longer. The Giver as a book, not necessarily a story. But I'm glad we got The Giver because The Giver was amazing, wrapped nicely. And then we got Gathering Blue. And right now, Gathering Blue, while it was wrapped nicely, there's so much more story to be explored in Messenger. And then at some point, eventually, Sun. So Gathering Blue can stand alone from The Giver, this specific book. But... 
you'll want to read the next one, I'm assuming. Well, I'm not assuming. I know you'll want to read the next one. I haven't read the next one yet, and I, I plan on talking about it. This book is so influential psychologically to me because Kira shouldn't be alive. She's alone. She's useless in this village. But at the same time, it sort of talks about centralized authority in a way. The dangers of having too much control in one place because they can be misguided especially if they have the wrong ideas and then they could sort of because of the centralized authority because it's really the village is at the at their they control it essentially they can make exceptions which maybe aren't so good and since they're really not elected they kind they're kind of dictators in a way Although, you feel safe with them. It's like uh, the moral dictator, if there could ever be one. Kind of. Like I said, you'll have to read the entire book. They're kind of like moral dictators, though, which is sort of amazing. Also, it's sort of a look on uh, society, sort of... I, don't, I, I, I hate to go on to this like, more left-leaning political agenda... Uh, not political agenda, but political rant where society does it, it discriminates because I don't think it does. Um, I think it's more, I think it's more of a warning against like communism because in basically Karl Marx's communism, the only way that you could try, not Karl Marx's in general, but in a way that you could, the only way that you could achieve this utopia is by weaving out the bad and the useless because you need productive people to take care of those who aren't productive. So in a way, it's a look at that. It's a look at condensed tribal human nature in a way. It's it's basically saying, I'm a human, here's a mirror, and this is the story. That's what the story is centered around. Tribalism. Uh, primitivism. Uh, community. Family. Uh, adversity goals, passion, skills, and art. And the story covers it amazingly. I can't go too much into detail without spoiling it. And I've basically rambled on for about 30 minutes. And I don't know if I said anything of value, but I just really wanted to talk about this book because Gathering Blue is amazing. I hope you guys pick it up. I really do. Um, I'll link it in the description box below for Amazon.com read it or go to the library and see if they have it at the very least just read it i bought the book and i am so glad that i bought the book because it is in my opinion a perfect book it just touches upon so many things and the ending it's so emotional too it it's there's this huge reveal it almost made me feel the same way that the giver did and i didn't think that gathering blue would do that because when because knowing that this was a sequel to the giver in a way knowing that there's other communities out there i assumed that this community was just like the community in the giver and in a way there's similarities but for the most part it's not it's completely different gathering blue is its own beast compared to the giver but with the way the giver ended i was like all right this is probably going to end like the giver and my expectation was subverted, but it was subverted for the better. The execution of the subversion was great because I got to the ending of this book and I was like, wow, that is so good. I want to keep reading. I want to know what happens next. And I felt that way with The Giver, which is why I like this book because I expected The Giver type of ending, but I didn't get the giver ending but i got the same feeling with maybe a little bit of a more no they both have emotional touches this ending was amazing it ends in such a perfect way kira has found her calling she found her purpose in life she found her purpose in the village she knows what she needs to do and i'm so excited to read the messenger i don't know if kira's in the messenger i assume she is um i I'm excited to read that book because even though she found her true 
calling at the end of this book, it leads on to, like, there should be so much more. Because not only did she find her calling, but how is she going to do her calling? How, because the ending of Gathering Blue sets up another problem. You see, with The Giver, it ends, and you could have a sequel of Jonas, you know, doing what he did at the, the ending of The Giver. Is he, is he dead? Did he find the other, another community when he heard the music? Should we go into that? But this this book, the ending, it's like, okay, here's this. Her Kira has found her meaning, which was the point of the story. So now we need to talk about how she's going to achieve her goal because she found her meaning, her calling. So how is she going to do it now that she knows it? And that's, I'm assuming that's the next book and that's the story that I want to hear, which is why this book drew me in because I wanted to see Kira do something. I wanted to see her make it out of the village, but kind of like Jonas did in The Giver. But this book subverted my expectations in a fantastic way. I got everything I wanted plus some that... I got exactly what I wanted out of this book, out of this story arc, and it's amazing, and you should read it. Have a good day, guys. Thanks for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want more content, don't forget to subscribe so you can check back and see more future videos regarding politics and culture. While you're at it, don't forget to hit the notification bell so you can be notified when a new video is uploaded. Also, check out my links to my Facebook and Twitter in the description box below. Ooh.